Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, I'm Sally Yates. I'm Deputy Attorney General, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you all here as we celebrate David Margolis's 50 years of service to the Department of Justice. This crowd, this extraordinary collection of friends and family is a testament to the many lives that David has touched over his tenure here at the Department of Justice. We're joined today by judges, members of Congress, current and former DOJ employees, a whole lot of people who came through the DAG's office and have gone on to, to bigger and better things and who spent time with Dave during their time in the DAG's office. I particularly want to recognize David's family his wife, Debbie, who is here today, his daughters, Kim and Sherry. You guys stand up, come on. That is you. <laughs> his son-in-law, FBI Special Agent James Mackey. and his three grandchildren, Nate, Owen, and Audrey. You all know firsthand just how much David has given to the department over these years, and so we're particularly pleased that you're able to join us today as we thank you for sharing him with us all of these years. It's fitting that we celebrate David's career on the same day that we formally swear in a new Attorney General. Because by my count, Loretta Lynch is now the 19th Attorney General to serve in David Margolis' Justice Department. <laughs> Political appointees come and go, but Dave Margolis is a constant. Every day, he demonstrates his recognition that the Department of Justice is an extraordinary power for good, but that our responsibility isn't just to win cases, it's to seek justice. While my time with him has been relatively short compared to many of yours here, I am so grateful for his counsel and for his wisdom, and I'm also grateful that he is not the one in charge of the department's dress code. <laughs> Although, I gotta tell you, Dave, you're looking pretty sporty. Yeah. There's got to be a food stain on there somewhere, so we're just going to have to look close. I was at a DAG's office party last week, and Dave told a group of us that he had been thinking about saying something at today's event, but he had been told that he shouldn't because it was inappropriate. And I told him, look, heck, Dave, I mean, you've been here 50 years. You can say whatever you want to say. And everybody else around me said, no! <laughs> yeah, no, no. <laughs> The fact of the matter is, is that I think that Dave would have said whatever he was thinking anyway, and isn't that one of the reasons why we love him so? Dave has been giving wise and on rare occasions, not so wise, but always candid counsel to AGs and DAGs and, I didn't, you know, you gotta watch out of the corner of my eye what's going on over here, <laughs> but to AGs and DAGs and, and to others in the Department of Justice for 50 years. His tenure is a powerful reminder to us that regardless of which political party is in power, this department, the Justice Department, is about something bigger than politics. He has been the living embodiment of our mission for all of these years. Now, at this same party, somebody else asked Dave how much longer he planned on working here at DOJ, and he mentioned he was planning on 10 more years. Um, this prompted Selena Powell, who is the ODAG office manager who put this whole event together today, it prompted Selena to exclaim, I'm not planning that party. <laughs> so, well, whoever plans that party, I look forward to seeing you all back here in 2025 as we celebrate Dave's 60 years at the Department of Justice. 
we have a number of people who want to be heard today. So I'm going to turn it over to our MC today, Chuck Rosenberg, or for those of you who were at the AG's event this morning, apparently he likes to be called Chuck Rosenberger now. <laughs> Chuck has a long history with Dave. As you all know, Chuck has served the Department of Justice in a number of really critical positions. He served as the U.S. Attorney in the Eastern District of Virginia, as Chief of Staff to the Deputy Attorney General, Chief of Staff to the Director of the FBI, and now, of course, is the um, Acting Administrator for the Drug Enforcement Administration. We've got a busy program, so take it away, Chuck. Thank you. In just a moment, I'm going to ask Rhea Walker to come up and uh, delight us with her rendition of God Bless America. But David, I just want to tell you that every single person that you see here today, these friends, family, dignitaries, alumni, are here for just one reason and one reason alone. And that's because we, were, we told them we were honoring Bob Mueller today. <laughs> oh, uh, if Rhea Walker from the Office of Justice Programs would uh, come up for her rendition of God Bless America. was absolutely spectacular. Thank you, Rhea. Many of you were here 10 years ago. Uh, Jim Comey was the DAG at the time. We celebrated David's 40th anniversary with the Department of Justice. Uh, also a remarkable day and a remarkable occasion. We thought we had an understanding with David uh, at that time, on that day, that he would finally leave. <laughs> <laughs> so, being lawyers, this time we have it uh, in writing. <laughs> David, you've served DOJ longer than uh, J. Edgar Hoover served as director of the FBI. 48 years for J. Edgar Hoover, 50 years for David Margolis. There aren't a lot of comparisons between the two of you, I recognize, <laughs> except perhaps that you're a more predictable dresser. <laughs> <laughs> um, 50 years is a very long time. I think, David, it's fair to say it's taken you 50 years to do what most of us have done in five or 10. <laughs> um, let me introduce uh, our first speaker. 
Charles Margolis is David Margolis' younger brother, a retired high school teacher from the Hartford area. Uh, David says he is also the poet laureate of South Windsor, Connecticut. So, Charles, podium is yours. Thank you and good afternoon, distinguished guests, friends of my brother, my family, haven't seen you in a long time. And oh yeah, Dave, nice to see you. I'm coming to the 60th party, I guarantee you. A Couple of weeks ago, Dave asked me to say a few words about what it was like to grow up with him. And I immediately thought of a poem I had written a couple of years ago, which I wanted to give him as a present, far cheaper than Mount Blanc pen, folks, much better. And so I was delighted to have this opportunity to share with you things that you may not know about him, although it appears you've got his number. <laughs> this poem, appropriately enough, is called Dave, and I hope you enjoy it. I used to caution my students, choose your heroes carefully. Before I knew superstars were media myths, my icons wore Yankee caps, cowboy boots, and blue suede shoes. I was busy back then, searching for myself. Fortunately, I lived with my role model. We were opposites. Opposites attract. He was tall, I was short. I still am. He was messy, I was neat. He studied hard, I hardly studied. He had confidence, I was self-conscious. He went to private school, I went to summer school. <laughs> I slept in his bed when he was away at college. He liked cream soda and roast beef sandwiches. He smoked Marlboro cigarettes and idolized Elvis. We had two sets of boxing gloves, matching sweaters, and identical red parkas. We played ball games with rolled up socks and a wastebasket. He gave me my nickname, my first bottle of aftershave, and a black eye. <laughs> I wanted to be him. Our paths were as different as the hawk from the sparrow. He planned to be a social worker. Dad's compass pointed him toward Cambridge. He went to law school. I learned to be a teacher. His career in justice took him to the pinnacle of public service. When he had bypass surgery, I cried. The years have melted faster than an ice cream cone on an August afternoon. Faces are fuller, lines are deeper. He has gray hair. I'm a dropout from the hair club for men. <laughs> He's portly. I drink port. He works seven days a week. I've retired. We exchange email every day, see each other infrequently. Myopia has altered our vision, but not our view of the old days. Since the age of pillow fights and backyard wiffle ball tournaments, one thing has remained constant. My brother is still my hero. Thank you. Funny because I've always thought of David as the older brother that I've never had and uh, never particularly wanted. <laughs> uh, it's my honor to introduce uh, the man who was the chief assistant U.S. attorney in the Hartford U.S. Attorney's Office when a young David Margolis first became an AUSA, uh, now a, su a senior superior court judge in Hartford, Connecticut, the Honorable John Mulcahy. Distinguished guests and uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, certainly my honor to be present this afternoon uh, commemorating the distinguished public career of uh, David Margolis. David and I served as AUSAs in the United States Attorney's Office for the District of Connecticut in the 1960s. Since that time, we have uh, uh, maintained a valued friendship and uh, I've uh, often conferred uh, with Davis David on a number of matters. As has been said, David grew up in the city of Hartford. He attended uh, uh, Weaver High, 
graduated from Loomis, Brown, and Harvard Law School. For some time uh, before I ever met David, I had heard from my own father uh, much about David's father, Louis Margolis, the very prominent and esteemed political figure in the city of Hartford. <coughs> now, I've uh, been asked uh, to uh, comment briefly, uh, briefly you'll be happy to hear, uh, on the U.S. Attorney's Office in Connecticut as we knew it uh, way back in the 1960s, and where David commenced uh, his uh, career as a government attorney. Actually, uh, both of our federal careers began uh, with the election of uh, President John F. Kennedy, and uh, in my case, with the uh, appointment of, uh, later to become, United States District uh, Judge Robert uh, Zampano as, a, as the Connecticut uh, United States Attorney. Upon uh, Judge Zampano's assuming uh, his judicial roles, uh, the Honorable John Newman, uh, later, later to be the Chief Judge, of uh, the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, became the U.S. Attorney, and it was at that point that David entered the U.S. Attorney's Office in Hartford, fresh out of Harvard. The office was entirely different in size and in its hiring procedure uh, then, uh, at that time, uh, from what it is uh, uh, today. The District Court in Connecticut sat in only two locations, one in New Haven and one in Hartford, and uh, to the best of my recollection, there were only four uh, district court judges uh, in Connecticut, uh, one, uh, two in uh, New Haven and two in Hartford, although Judge Timbers would occasionally uh, hear cases in a very decrepit old factory building that the government apparently leased uh, from the city of Bridgeport. The U.S. Attorney's Office today is comprised, I am told, of uh, approaching 100 uh, attorneys and uh, uh, with a sizable support staff. In our day, uh, as I say, it uh, was entirely different with the U.S. Attorney in Hartford and uh, four assistants in each of the two court locations, uh, Hartford uh, and uh, New Haven. Uh, the U.S. Attorney's, uh, that, has prompted, that has prompted a number of U.S. Attorneys, uh, including uh, the one that hired me many years ago, uh, Bob Sam Campano, uh, commenting through the years that, see, uh, we accomplished with only uh, roughly nine or ten judge, uh, nine or ten uh, attorneys what it now takes the office a uh, hundred uh, to do. Now, I'm not particularly familiar with the uh, uh, policies and procedures that have evolved over the past 50 years regarding the appointment and hiring of assistant U.S. attorneys. I suspect that the hiring practice has become far more formalized and substantially merit-based. Uh, suffice it to say, in our time, uh, David, uh, uh, fine academic credentials uh, and merit, while they were very important, may not have been uh, the decisive uh, factor in uh, hiring and getting the job. Uh, political support, especially from the members of the congressional delegation, uh, uh, and most importantly, uh, uh, Senator, late Senator, Senator Stodd and Ribicoff uh, could prove rather helpful. Now, Davis always said, particularly after a few beers, uh, uh, that uh, uh, he, uh, uh, and he quite vehemently maintained that his initial appointment uh, as AAUSA rested entirely on merit. Uh, that is, he received the appointment solely on his fine academic record, uh, on his uh, vast courtroom experience, fresh out of Harvard, and uh, uh, on his outstanding educational accomplishments. Unfortunately, I never got the opportunity to ask uh, Louis Margolis, the seasoned politician, uh, what he thought about that. Well, actually, I really didn't have to ask because I knew the answer. And uh, it would have been perhaps the same as my father's. Uh, it would have uh, been very brief, perhaps two words, but in any event, uh, I'll leave uh, uh, David to tell you about that. Uh, I think uh, Lou uh, would have been, uh, uh, perhaps that uh, would have said, 
uh, perhaps at best, uh, academics, while having something to do with it, didn't have too much to do with it. Uh, and I, remembering Lou, as I was when I was putting, as I did when I was putting uh, together these remarks, uh, I know how proud he would have been to be here today and see all that uh, David has accomplished uh, in the interim. Now in the 1960s, there was no real specialization in the Connecticut office. There were no particularized divisions or bureaus as exist today, and we uh, all handled our share fair of both civil and criminal cases. It was excellent experience, of course, for all of us, many of whom uh, subsequently went into private practice. Interestingly, back in those days, uh, with respect to criminal cases, during a good portion of the 1960s, there uh, were no full-time career public defenders, as this was, I guess, uh, before the full implementation of the Criminal Justice Act. Uh, most defendants were represented by private counsel, and those who were not were assigned practicing attorneys by the judge, oftentimes uh, on the uh, recommendation and suggestions of the AUSA handling the case. <laughs> David certainly proved himself to be an extraordinary uh, able trial lawyer, litigating many of the most difficult and complicated cases that we had in the district. Uh, those of us in Hartford uh, developed close friendships with personal, uh, personnel from the major federal enforcement agencies, uh, which friendships span uh, many years. Uh, socializing it, to put it mildly, David, uh, uh, with uh, uh, federal agents and local police was commonplace, and uh, on occasion rather eventful. So much so that uh, uh, covering this, uh, that uh, uh, the U.S. attorney uh, in hosting uh, David's uh, bachelor's party decided to have it uh, in his uh, own backyard where he could monitor more closely uh, the uh, uh, socializing or perhaps uh, uh, more accurately put uh, the antics uh, of his wayward young assistants. Beyond that, if David wishes to go into any uh, detail, Dave, you may. Uh, when I look back, I, uh, uh, the manner in which we uh, kind of covered the streets with local police personnel, uh, I uh, don't think that that uh, uh, type of social contact uh, uh, perhaps uh, would be countenanced uh, by the protocols which are in place today. However, at that time, and perhaps fortunately, uh, there existed an extremely cordial and friendly relationship with members of the press who regularly covered just about daily the federal courts. Uh, thankfully, it was an entirely trusting relationship on both sides, not quite as uh, guarded as that inter interaction with the media is today. And all the 1960s uh, were professionally challenging and rewarding uh, years in a political realm, however. Uh, nothing lasts forever. The expected finality descended upon us in 1968 uh, with the election of Richard, Nixon, uh, Richard Milhouse Nixon as the 37th President of the United States. We were out and we all went in various directions uh, David to justice. Through the years, uh, uh, David would, would often told me how privileged he considered himself to be with the greatest and most important law firm in the world, DOJ. Dave, congratulations on 50 years. Thank you very much. Yeah, we're just going to start from the top. Sally, if you wouldn't mind uh, <laughs> introducing the uh, event. Uh, Paul Coffey was one of the legendary prosecutors in uh, this department, as many of you know. Unlike David, he didn't require that we mark each six-month interval in his career with a party. Uh, um, he replaced David as the chief of organized crime when uh, David became Bob Mueller's deputy in the criminal division. For those of you who have been in David's office, uh, the walls are covered with stuff, but one of my favorite things 
is what purports to be an organization chart of the criminal division with Bob Mueller in the AAG box. And the title across the top says, Bob Mueller's Worst Nightmare. And every box below it is filled with the name David Margolis. <laughs> Please welcome Paul Coffey. How are you guys doing? Uh, Debbie, uh, Sherry, Kim, Dave. Okay, let's get down to specifics if we can. First of all, you've got your program, right? You see the picture here? And there's a paragraph that says a bank robber single-handedly, or Dave negotiated a single-handed surrender to a bank robbery on a deserted baseball field. And the reason is the bank robber was given two choices, 10 years in jail or 10 years working for Dave's tailor. <laughs> now imagine that we are visitors to the office of the chief of the organized crime and racketeering section in the 1980s. Many of you were. The first thing you see upon entering the office on the immediate left is a framed black and white photograph of Hank Williams Sr. And Hank is wearing a cowboy hat and blue jeans, no shirt, no shoes, looking like a man who had just spent the night in jail, which in fact he had. And on the right wall, in color, on velvet, a painting of Elvis Presley. And the king is wearing a white jumpsuit, studded diamonds, and cowboy boots. And sitting between these two icons at the desk is, of course, our legend, David Nami, no middle initial, Margolis. <laughs> and today is a typical day. He's wearing scruff cowboy boots, unpolished, bell-bottom blue jeans, a studded leather belt, and a Lone Star belt buckle the size of a cantaloupe. He has no suit, no tie. He's wearing, as usual, his baseball jersey, which is white with blue sleeves. And on the front is a picture of his other, one of his other legends, country singer Jerry Jeff Walker. And on the back, in big bold letters that a blind man could read from across the room, are words that read, hellbound and whiskey bent. And you, we might wonder why a person who is in charge of the federal, concerted federal effort against organized crime would come to work dressed in this manner. And the reason is obvious. At this time in the 1980s, Dave was the principal federal official in charge of the concerted federal effort against organized crime, which was at that time the most dangerous and violent criminal organization in the United States. And so, as a security measure, <laughs> it was necessary for Dave to come to work cleverly disguised as a homeless person. <laughs> yeah. Now, I could no more summarize in seven hours, let alone the seven minutes that had been allotted to me, to summarize Dave's accomplishments in the 21 years that he served magnificently in the organized crime section, except to point out, as most of you already know, it was during his reign as chief that the first great family RICO cases began uh, to be indicted that brought down one crime family after another, not to mention the liberation of labor unions and related industries that the mob had infiltrated. And I probably should also point out that it was during this period, under Dave's direction, an army of strike force attorneys unleashed a novel approach to criminal trial practice that left hundreds of federal judges in a constant state of anxiety. <laughs> and we will hear speakers today that uh, will talk about Dave's competence and integrity and uh, the devotion and love that he's given to this institution. So I thought I would give two examples that show a different character trait that otherwise might not be uh, mention is quick wit. And the first example occurred 
in Abscan, which Dave was in overall charge of. And it was hot, and it was on the front pages of all the newspapers pretty much around the country, maybe around the world. And the U.S. attorneys in Brooklyn and Newark were fighting each other, fighting their respective strike force chiefs, fighting their respective FBI offices, all of whom in turn were fighting for turf and procedures and, and resources here at the department. And Dave had spent the whole day frustratingly attempting to negotiate these, uh, this internecine struggle. Until about 9.30 at night, he and McDowell finally uh, were able to leave work and drive home to Reston. And as they got nearby, near to Reston, in a back road, dark and wooded, out of nowhere came a white horse which jumped the fence and landed smack dab right in front of their vehicle. And McDowell slams on the brakes, nearly avoiding a lethal accident by inches, at which point a thoroughly disgusted Dave mutters, horses asses all day long and now I've got one in my face. <laughs> The other example occurred in a room that I can see right through the back windows here in the second floor of Main Justice in my office. And I had one of these small miniature Nerf balls, the football, which I unexpectedly tossed at young Bryson, who was wandered down from the SG's office uh, to catch up on the gossip. And in the startled reaction to the toss, Bill poured a full cup of coffee all over his clothes. And after a couple of seconds of horrified silence, Bill says, Ah, oh, gee, this is my only good suit. At which point Dave, who's sitting a few feet away, pipes right up instantly, Not so fast, Bryson. Don't you mean to say that used to be your only good suit? <laughs> So these halls, these very halls, in fact, this very floor, legends, the names of legends have resonated with those who led the fight against organized crime in the magnificent history of the organized crime and racketeering section. And these are names like Peterson and Keeney and Lynch and Hunley and Muhlenberg. Big Mac, Iron Mike, and Mother McGuire. But we celebrate today the man who did more, means more, and is the greatest legend of them all in the glorious history of the organized crime and racketeering section, and that is David Nami Margolis. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. I think Paul's right. David is a legend. In many ways, I think he's the heart and soul of this department. Although, if you think about it, there are probably other body parts that better describe what we really think of him. Uh, our next speaker, Scott Schools, was an AUSA in South Carolina. He served as the interim United States Attorney in South Carolina and in San Francisco. Uh, he finished his career at the department as an Associate Deputy Attorney General working with David. Scott's now in private practice back home in Charleston. Scott, here you are. It really would have been helpful if someone had told me there was going to be children present. <laughs> it's good to be back as I look out into the, uh, the and see the department legends that are on that I am facing, I'm kind of wondering to myself, what am I doing up here? Um, but I don't think I've ever been up here before. It's kind of nice. <laughs> I think I like it. I might come back. Um, it's among my highest honors to have been asked by David to be one of the speakers of, on this occasion. Um, 
I wasn't expecting it, and it's a, it's a real privilege for me to be here. And I, I just kind of like to tell you a little bit of the story about, about David and I. I. I was first coming to DC in 2005, and I think I had, to the best of my recollection, met David one time. I came up to be interviewed to be the interim US attorney in South Carolina, and Johnny Sutton and David interviewed me in his office. And I liked him, it was 2001, it was fine. And then on January, but on January 1st, 2005, as I drove to Washington to begin a new job up here, Never would I have dreamed that I was become the Felix and a Simon-esque odd couple <laughs> with Margolis. For starters, if you've ever seen the odd couple, nobody wants to be Felix, right? <laughs> but, you know, Oscar was cooler, a little bit more of a slob. You know, all things are relative, I have to admit. Margolis is cooler than me, and he's certainly a bigger slob. So <laughs> that makes him Oscar and me Felix. But our friendship was more unlikely in many ways because on paper we just sort of have very little in common. I, David went to Harvard Law School. I went to Texas, for God's sakes. I wear a white shirt to work every day. David doesn't own one unless you count an ill-fitting school-logoed sweatshirt that he might wear on a Saturday. Um, David... I used to come to work and eat a chicken breast, a boneless chicken breast for lunch just about every day, and let's just say boneless chicken breast is not on David's menu. <laughs> I still remember the day when we went to the DOJ cafe and he, and he was so tempted by both the chicken and the ribs and couldn't resolve which one to get, so he got fried chicken and ribs for lunch in the DOJ cafe. <laughs> and he deserves a big round of applause. <laughs> And it's not just that. It's the first time we went to a, a baseball game. Um, if I was counting right, Margolis ate four, crack, four hot dogs with a Cracker Jack topper. <laughs> and he loves to go to Fogo de Chow for the all-you-can-eat meat fest at lunch. <laughs> so we had lots of differences, but I think the biggest difference, of course, what, course, was that I'm a Southerner, and David is a proud Yankee who has never given a damn about anything from the South or anybody from the South who wasn't or isn't a current Deputy Attorney General. <laughs> <laughs> but despite these hurdles, when I came to Washington, we found we had a few things in common. We both worked Saturdays, so uh, on, on many Saturdays, David and I would keep each, co each other company by phone, talking about the latest OIG or OPR report or U.S. attorney sex scandal or whatever the case may be. And we also made each other laugh. We both managed to find humor in the things that I worked on and he resolved. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so over time we sort of became friends and David became perhaps from my perspective one of my most unlikely benefactors and in 2007 at the urging of David I was summoned to EOUSA to be interviewed to be a candidate for the interim US attorney job in the Northern District of California and I was interviewed by David Mike Battle and uh, she whose name shall not be mentioned but regardless of that <laughs> I look back on that and I realize I may have actually misread that situation because what I took to be David's confidence in me that I could go to the Northern District of California and be U.S. Attorney may have actually been differently motivated. It may be that David actually thought him not caring much about the South and not too much about the Northern District of California, if we send this chucklehead from South Carolina to be the U.S. Attorney in San Francisco, how can what happens next not be funny? <laughs> So I went to San Francisco, and in the fall of 2007, I got a call from Craig Morford, who uh, suggested that he and David had come up with a plan that when I was done in San Francisco, I would come back to Washington, work as an ADAG with Margolis, learn the ropes under him, and then maybe someday actually fill his shoes. And I was kind of blown away by that suggestion, and it was just so I agreed to come do that. So beginning in January of 2008, I had a front row seat to what I would call the David Margolis show, and, and I learned a lot about both of us, but mostly a lot about the guy who we're here to honor today. I first of all learned about his commitment. 
we were in the DOJ cafe one day, and I said, David, when's the last time you took a vacation? And he says, well, if you count taking my family to see my mother, 1986, <laughs> if you don't count that, it was 1980. And so I thought, I said, well, why is that? And he said, well, you know, you just get out of habit. But what I came to realize over time was that David Margolis never wanted to be away from his post when the department needed him. And so he's been coming to this job six or seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, since at least 1986, maybe 1980, and probably 1965. His commitment to this institution is literally unparalleled. I also learned how hard his job was and why he was so good at it. One of the things he and I worked on together was the resolution of the objections to the OPR report that dealt with the work that the OLC attorneys had done regarding enhanced interrogation techniques. Now, we knew as we were working on that matter that there's no good answer. That however that comes out, one political faction or another is going to be hugely disappointed and will roundly criticize David. But I knew that the opinion was going to be issued under his name and that he's the only guy who could issue that opinion and have it perceived as final and legitimate. And my assessment was proved correct because when that opinion came out, two very strange things happened. First of all, the Washington Post wrote an editorial suggesting he had gotten it right. And then there was a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing. David had said, I'll write the opinion, but I'm not going to testify. So Gary Grindler, who was acting DAG at the time, volunteered, no, not really volunteered, drew the short straw <laughs> and was going to testify at that hearing just one week after that opinion issued. And we prepped hearing Gary for all the grilling that he might take during that hearing and went to the hearing, and as it turned out, it was so gentle, I actually felt sorry for the code pink contingency that had showed up expecting fireworks. <laughs> but only David could pull that off, because over time, he had developed a reputation that he understood that regardless how many directions he was being pulled in, all he had to do was call it and he, as he saw it and let the chips fall where they may. And David Margolis had that reputation based on having dealt with the hardest issues in the, department, in the department, from Vince Foster to enhanced interrogation techniques and everything in between. He has an uncanny sense of doing only what the facts demand and ignoring all the collateral consequences. I also learned that he was, of course, uncommonly and wickedly funny, even when times were a little stressful. He loves to tell stories about the times he's testified before Congress, and there's one time when he was testifying before Congress, he was asked by one of the senators or congressmen, Mr. Margolis, how many people work at the Department of Justice, to which he responded, about 60% of them. <laughs> and then he likes to tell the story, and this was not a happy time for him or the department, but he was testifying before a committee investigating the U.S. Attorney firings, Preet Bharara, who was chief counsel for the committee chairman, was going to question David. And David walked into the hearing room, and Preet was standing. As David approached the witness table, David, who was also standing, instinctively raised his hand to be sworn, at which point Preet says, Mr. Margolis, that's OK. We've reached an agreement with the department. We're not going to swear the witnesses, at which point Mar Margolis goes, Phew, that's a relief. <laughs> <laughs> But I realized over time that David's humor was not just a trait. It actually is, I think, a huge part of why he was so successful in the department. When Mr. Keeney was retiring, Lanny Brewer decided it would be a good idea to have an interview with David Margolis and Jack Keeney for the criminal division and he, so that they could talk about their careers. And he invited me, and it was indeed a great idea. And it, the contrast was stark, despite Lanny's best efforts. Mr. M Mr. Keeney was, was the, the unavowed pragmatist, and despite Lanny's efforts to get him to wax profound, Mr. Keeney just refused to such an extent that when, Mr. When, when Lanny, in his most sort of sympathetic, pleading voice, said, no, Mr. Keeney, what was it like to be captured by enemy lines in World War II? Mr. McKinney goes, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> And, Mr. and when Mr. Keeney was asked towards the end of the ceremony of the, of the presentation, what is it that you would advise young department attorneys 
so that they might find success within the department. Mr. Keeney's response was, take your discovery obligations very seriously. <laughs> <laughs> David had a different answer to that last question. His answer to that question, very, delivered very seriously, was take the work deadly seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously. And I, th I think that among the reasons we're here celebrating David's 50th anniversary is because he has walked that walk from day one. He has always, always, always taken the, ver the work very seriously and never, never, never taken himself too seriously. And as a result of that, he made himself a trusted advisor and friend to some of the most impressive people that this nation has ever produced. You don't in this life often get a chance to publicly thank the people that, shape, that have shaped your life, at least while they're breathing. <laughs> um, <laughs> but David has been an amazing influence in my life. Um, I, the circumstances, I think, that led to his and I becoming that odd couple were wholly improbable, but I'm so glad that they occurred because so many good things flowed from that, including, probably most importantly to me, that I count David Margolis among my best friend. David, I, I can't thank you enough for what you've done for me personally, what you've done for the Department of Justice, and what you've done for the country. After 50 years, you're still the man. So Scott just mentioned a U.S. attorney sex scandal, right? And for the life of me, I cannot think of what he was referring to. And there's some U.S. attorneys here. Rod is here, Dane is here, Vince is here. That is a horrifying image. <laughs> I, I, I literally don't know how I'm going to get that out of my head. The, the, the only thing that I could think of, and this is actually a true story, and it's, I don't know if it's a scandal or not, but it, it has something to do with sex. Um, seems like a strange path to be walking down in the Great Hall, but is when, true story, People Magazine named Pat Fitzgerald as one of the sexiest men in America. Do you remember that? Pat is many, many things. <laughs> he is not one of the sexiest men in America. But if People Magazine could name Pat Fitzgerald is one of the sexiest men in America. We absolutely can recognize David as one of our finest lawyers. <laughs> um, Kathy Remler has served uh, this department in our country in many different ways. She was in AUSA in DC. She was on the Enron Task Force, where I first met her when I was in Houston. Uh, she was the paydag in this department, and most recently in government service, uh, was counsel to President Obama. Uh, please welcome back to the department, Kathy Remler. Good afternoon, everybody. It is such an honor to be here today to honor my dear friend David Margolis on his 50 years of service at the department. And I'm going to take just a moment to gloat and, and tell, remind David that I don't yet know what it's like to breathe for 50 years, much less <laughs> to dedicate that amount of time to an institution. But it really is a remarkable accomplishment. And I just feel so privileged to be here with David and with all of you on this really special occasion. There are many people in the room who have had the opportunity to work with and really to learn from David Margolis. But I feel particularly special in this regard, because I am the only person in 50 years at the Department of Justice who can say, I was David Margolis' pay deck. And that's right. Um, you may recall that, that President Obama appointed David Margolis as the acting Deputy Attorney General in early 2009, pending David Ogden's confirmation as Deputy Attorney General. And I was his pay deck during that period of time. And the former pay decks in the room will know, and I see many of you, uh, will know exactly what I mean when I say that the relationship between the DAG and the pay DAG is a very special one. And it's, it's important 
that that partnership um, you know, be sort of a true bond. And really it's one of the most important partnerships, I think, in the entire department. And some of you may be thinking, boy, what a strange pairing. David likes baseball, bad ties, beer, and beef. Kathy likes nice shoes, nice wine, tofu. Um, but we did share something that transcended our differences, and, and that is an absolute unwavering commitment to the long-term interests of the Department of Justice. David and I refer to this period when he was the acting DAG as the halcyon days. For David, I think that much of that idyllic feeling during those days stemmed from the fact that he had a security detail that would drive him to Harry's for lunch. <laughs> but for me, it was because this was the time that I really came to understand and appreciate some of the important yet often unstated rules of the department. It was during this time that I learned from David how the department really worked. For example, he taught me that every, and I mean every, component of the department reports to the office of the Deputy Attorney General. It's true. That includes the FBI. I'm glad Director Comey's not here anymore. We, we can remind him when he comes in. It, <laughs> it includes the criminal division. And this one really came as a shock to me. It even includes the United States Attorney's Office for the Southern District of New York. <laughs> And David thought it was important for me as the PAYDAG not only to understand these rules in the abstract, but also that I was armed with practical advice about how to implement them. For example, I remember early on in the Halcyon days that Director Mueller was unhappy about some decision or another that the DAG's office had made, and he had placed a call and expressed his displeasure. And so I walked into David's office and was wringing my hands and said, oh, Director Mueller's really upset. What should I do? And Margolis said, oh, don't worry. Just call him back and say, Bobby Three Sticks, chill out. <laughs> and, and point him to the org chart. <laughs> Incidentally, that org chart tactic came in very handy when I moved over to the White House. <laughs> David also taught me that there were other more subtle ways in which you could remind the components of their proper place in the department hierarchy. For example, you make them come to you for meetings. During the Halcyon days, we did not really travel beyond the fourth floor. <laughs> Unless, of course, we were summoned to the fifth floor because, you know, every now and then the AG would want to know what the hell was going on down there. <laughs> David also taught me that if you use size 48 font in your emails, people will naturally be intimidated because they assume you're yelling at them. <laughs> He taught me to be wary of the drive-by briefing, where someone from a department component purports to brief you on an incredibly sensitive and potentially politically explosive topic by giving you two sentences at the end of a rehashed 30-minute presentation about their need for more FTEs, thereby infecting you with the information but providing you no basis to ask any reasoned questions about it. During his time in ODAG, um, in sum, he taught me everything I needed to know to navigate the rocky shoals of the fourth floor, and he taught me how to keep a sense of humor in doing it. But in all seriousness, the most important lesson that he taught me, not through his words, but through his actions every single day, was what it meant, what it really meant to make decisions with integrity. To make decisions impossible, no win, 51, 49 decisions with care, with dedication, with discipline, with humanity, with impeccable judgment, without regard to how he would be perceived in rendering the decision, but with a laser-like focus on what was best for the Department of Justice. He taught me about fairness. He taught me that government power must always be used with an acute understanding of the effects it has on people, on victims of crimes, on targets of investigations, on employees of the department. He taught me that the cases that you don't bring are as important as the cases that you do bring. He taught me that even though the media and members of Congress have perfect 2020 hindsight, 
When we are evaluating the work of our colleagues, we must resist the pressure to adopt that perspective. He has taught these things and so many more to all of us who have had the privilege to work with him at the department over his 50 years of service. He has taught us, perhaps above all else, that this institution is bigger, much bigger than any one of us. Guile, bluff, balls, good colleagues, and some luck. This is how David Margolis has explained his survival for 50 years in this place. I would add to that list that he has one of the biggest hearts of anybody I've ever known. Congratulations on 50 years, David. I'm so proud to call you my friend. I'm forever grateful for all that you have taught me. I love you. Here's to the halcyon days. Let me just interject. You notice I hugged all the men. That was just a cover so I could hug Kathy. 